I hope you enjoyed listening to that discussion. And once again, thank you everyone who supports my podcast, my YouTube, and all of my other work. It is so much appreciated. And without you guys watching my content and helping boost it, I don't think I'd ever get the opportunities to talk to amazing people such as Temple Grandin and be able to pick their brains on all sorts of these topics. So I really appreciate everyone who supports my channel. For those of you who are interested in other ways to support me, I have a Patreon channel that you can go and check out, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash s-d-e-q-u-u-s, and you can subscribe to have access to tutorials, training videos, uh, different types of training write-ups, studies, write, like breakdowns, my opinions of studies, and um, me just taking pieces from them to help people learn because I can't share the studies, unfortunately. Um, and I also have an online shop that you can shop on, shopmilestoneequestrian.c. Well, my name's Temple Grandin, and I am a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. And I've been there for 30 years. I work in animal behavior. And when I was a teenager and getting bullied in high school, horses were one of my refuges away from bullying. It was one of the few places I had friends was with riding horses. I also took care of the school's horse barn and I cleaned nine stalls every day and fed the horses and took care of them. They were basically my life when I was in high school. That is so cool that your high school had a horse barn. That's amazing. Um, and I, I really actually relate to that because that was kind of me in high school as well. Um, with with the horses and bullying um so yeah you you've done so much like I've read so much about what you've done for um the slaughter industry for improving practices within um the slaughterhouses for the animals I read a, I haven't finished it yet but I was reading a bit of your book thinking in pictures and I found it super interesting to hear about how when you were doing that you would walk around at their eye level and notice things that no one else would pick up on that was scaring the animals um in those plants so specific to horses I kind of wanted to touch on that thought process and ask you do you have any things in like modern traditional horse stall barn setups or like think about like the average boarding facility um in the modern world where horses are kept things that you notice that humans might not be aware of, but that well, are uh, impacting horses, welfare. Where horses get scared is in an unfamiliar environment. And when I got down in the chutes and, and I looked at what cattle were seeing, they only go through that chute once. Or let's say it's in a feed yard for vaccinations, they might go through it twice. So they're going into a new place. So any little shadow, a chain hanging down, a reflection, seeing a vehicle parked along the facility would make the animals stop. Now, in a boarding stable, after the horse gets used to it, you might have a sunbeam or shadow on the floor that he'll get used to walking over. Now, when he first goes in that stable, that's when he would stop at it. And there'll be a tendency of, let's say, there's a sunbeam on the floor or a really sharp shadow. The animal may put its head down to look, give it the opportunity to look, or maybe a drain in the middle of the floor. Any place, place where the floor changes, they tend to stop. Now, a horse that's lived in that barn for a month is just going to walk over that drain. But let's say they go to a veterinary clinic where that's a strange new environment. They may not want to walk over the drain. Uh, give the animal a chance to look at it. And then when the head comes back up, then try to lead them over the drain. Um, you see, new things are both scary and attractive. Something new is attractive if your animal can voluntarily approach it. And it's scary if you suddenly shove it in their face. And... And um, my student, Megan Corgan, recently did a paper on, um, on the reaction of a quarter horses to a complex rotated object. Uh, did you see that paper? I don't know if it's the exact same paper, but I've seen another one on something like that where they were seeing how horses reacted to an object as they oriented it differently. Well, that's exactly what this paper was Perfect. about. And what we took was a children's play set with a little swing and a slide and very colorful and walked uh, fillies and colts by it 15 16 times until they no longer reacted these were halter broke but not trained to ride yet fillies and colts and when that place that was rotated it became a new object but think about it i'm going to demonstrate here with my book visual thinking my new book the child's slide is going to look like this in one position 
and like this in the other position. See how different that looks? It became a new object. We would tend to look at that and go, yeah, it's a kid's toy. Mm -hmm. But it looks very different when it's turned. And this may explain some of the unexplained spooking the horse does. Well, it just spooked. Yeah. In fact, one of the students told me that her horse spooked when she put its feed trough up on end and leaned it against the wall. The horse hadn't ever seen his feed trough in that position, and it became a new object mm -hmm. because it would have looked very different. And then I have, we have a paper on this, a free access paper. It's the title, something like a reaction to a complex rotated object in the American quarter horse. They just they insisted on having American quarter horse in there. <laughs> um, but then I kind of informally repeated the experiment with some Western riders. Everything was done at a walk. This was done at a walk or it would have been dangerous. Well, he we walked the Western riders by this big green chair, big green outdoor porch chair until they no longer reacted, no longer stopped, rotated this chair 90 degrees and half the horses did a hard stop when the chair was rotated 90 degrees. Wow. Well, if that had been done at a gallop, the riders would have been done. Oh, yeah, they would have so shot I over Very there. carefully, we did it at yeah. a walk. I didn't want anything dangerous. I just wanted to prove the point that when that object got rotated, the horses were going to stop. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of horse people, surprisingly, they don't consider that because I've noticed, um, I don't know. That, that the next the next question that I was going to have with you will will play into this but in horse sports for example when you're traveling to tons and tons of new places um and like for jumping for example basically okay. every new jump you see is going to be a new object but what growing up what I was taught to do when horses would do stuff like that is to like to punish them use the whip kick them don't let no, them get no, away no, with no, it no, let's not yeah do yeah yeah exactly so i wanted to ask what's your opinion on like the ethicality of horse sports um for like well, be it horse racing fine if they're done right i went to the yeah. big fancy uh, jumping and dressage world cup in omaha and uh, the dressage horses were sweating flipping their tails around a lot of sign of stress and people think this is normal frothing at the mouth yeah. The one that won, and this made me pleased, the horse that won the dressage was relaxed and he yeah. wasn't covered in sweat. And I think he enjoyed doing the pee off. I don't think the, I think the other horses thought it was the piss off. <laughs> and and this is something where they think force is the way to do it. Now, you take a horse around to enough jumping courses. There's a certain sameness. And there is a somewhat of a little bit of ability to generalize. Okay, the horse goes in five or six different one horse trailers, just typical regular ones. Now he'd probably go in another one horse trailer. Mm -hmm. But if a horse had smashed his head the first time he went into a one horse trailer, he's going to hate one horse trailers. But mm -hmm. he may be fine in a big show van because that looks very different. Mm -hmm. So you can sometimes um, solve a problem with something you're afraid of by making it different. Um, at our right horse program, this is a program where students train rescue horses so they can rehab them and then and then sell them as riding good riding horses and this one horse was frothing at the mouth of this bit just frothing at the mouth and um, it was a jointed snaffle bit and I think in the past he'd been abused with that bit because these were rescues we don't know the history so we went in the tack room and we found a one-piece straight bar bit that's going to feel different mm -hmm. no more frothing at the mouth cool it was like yeah. opening a new file folder in that horse's brain. So then I have the students, and this is one of the things we do now, is hold the different bits, jointed bits versus straight bits, and think of them as feeling pictures. And then anecdotally, I have talked to a number of people where they switched bits, and that solved a lot of problems because the horse had bad memories with maybe being abused with a bit, and often it's a snaffle they get abused with. And then you replace it with one piece. So we actually did this in the mm -hmm. right horse program last spring. That was my best day. That's we so put cool. put that straight bit in and it worked like magic. Regarding that, the, the frothing, there's a belief oh, right. in, the, in the horse world that frothing means that they're relaxed in the jaw and that they're soft. And well, I just wasn't wanted, soft. Yeah, and yeah. was frothing at the mouth, all tense and terrible. Yeah. And when we put the one piece in, it stopped. Okay. It was not relaxed. 
relaxed. Do you think there's any situations in which horses will froth at the mouth when they are relaxed? Or do you think that's like a misnomer that people have created to justify the behavior? Well, I think most of the time it's it's, a, yeah. it's stress. Yeah, I agree. These horses at this World Cup in Omaha that I just went to, this was within the last year. Half these horses, was the dressage are covered in sweat, completely covered in sweat. And this was an indoor arena. Oh, wow. It was not hot there. Yeah. Yeah, people think that's, like, I, I've seen that a lot, too, and I've thought the same things. They'll be, like, frothing sweat. It's not even, like, they're just, like, damp sweat. And they'll be like, oh, it's just really hard work. They're athletes, but. Well, no, they, yeah. they, it's not that hard of work because they don't sweat like that uh, if they're not stressed. When it, And the horse uh, just goes out and does the jumping course once. Yeah. It shouldn't be covered in sweat. Now, I think 100%. it's really good to take horses out to lots of different novel places because mm -hmm. then then they're less likely to see something new that would scare them mm -hmm. and some of the worst things are bad uh, flags bikes and balloons mm -hmm. flags bikes and balloons are really bad and one of the ways to get them used to bikes is they'll let a horse just come up to a stationary bike then you walk it around then gradually ride it mm -hmm. introduce it gradually drones can be another issue now, if a drone just stays way up in the air, it, they, they don't notice that. But we had a really, really bad thing happen at our equine center with a news photographer who took a drone and went at some horses, like a plane oh, no. coming into a plane. Oh, no. And these, they were two Western horses. They were all tacked up. They got so freaked out. They were not rideable for 20 minutes. I oh, my gosh. It. it took 20 minutes for those horses to calm down. Then we get on them to ride them. And this idiot takes his drone again and comes right at us like this. Oh, my God. I We were very lucky not to get bucked off. It was the dumbest thing. Yeah. Now, Jeez. what we need to be doing is get them accustomed to drones. First of all, let them just see it. Mm -hmm. Hold it in your hand. And the other thing is if you put a drone way up in the air. And I've seen this with cattle, too. And you slowly just bring it down. They, they look up and stare at it. Yeah. But when it swoops horizontally, that's when it really scares. And if an animal gets really scared, it takes 20 minutes to calm back down. Just think about it. Have you ever been in a near car accident? Yeah. A near car accident. Think about how long it took you to calm down after that. Oh, yeah. A long time because you feel all shaky and nervous. That's after right. That's and, 20, yeah. 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So the next question that I had for you um is from the horse world what would be some of the most um like the biggest ethical problems that you would identify that you think need to be addressed in the horse world well we have two things here what we do in training and what we do with breeding there's two issues here i think it's fine to have dressage and have jumping and there was one horse there that won it and i think he had fun doing it and that's the way it should be now, I'm very concerned about these racehorses that have died recently, uh, and it's not been fully explained. You know, we're breeding that animal for speed. So what you end up breeding is little fins, lightweight skeleton, big muscles, big heart. And I think they're getting some heart failure. Uh, you over-select for the performance trait, speed, you're going to get into trouble. I'm very concerned about that. I'm concerned about things we're doing with cattle right now, too where we're breeding just for big meat and we've got foot and leg problems. This is, and we have some heart problems, dying of heart failure. And those horses that died, what happened? Was it a broken leg? I certainly like to see what the hearts look like. Do they have heart failure? This is stuff that we need to know. Mm -hmm. We found we found out in cattle that um, genetics is very much related to heart failure. And um, one feed yard told me that they were doing um, Angus semen on Holstein um, to make um, Angus Holstein cross steers. And and they uh, one sire was causing a lot of heart failure. Wow. Because they had absolute trace back. I have real problems. I don't care if it's a pet, whether it's a meat animal, a production animal, or milking cow, or it's a performance animal. You overselect for any trait, you are going to ruin your animal. And the problem that you have is this, these problems happen slowly. Mm -hmm. I call that bad becoming normal. Thinking that horses are sweating all over is normal. Is it That's bad becoming normal. 
and you can slowly creep into that. I'm concerned about some of these Arabians where the dish face makes them look like a seahorse. Yeah. Uh, these these kinds of things really concern me. And you type extreme Arabian horse into Google images and you see app. Yeah, they're, and they're I just I think that's just terrible. You know, dish face is nice, but don't overdo it. Yeah. So genetics and then rough training methods. One of the things that's that's getting more and more gentle training methods. I was really pleased what they were doing with the right horses. Uh, very gently gentling them. They also teach them to ride with the halter and the saddle before they even put bridle on. And they don't just shove the bit in their mouth and force it. One thing, the first I watched one horse that was getting first introduced to the bit and he was going like this. And then when he stopped for just a second, they took it out. Aww. In other words, when they cooperate, mm -hmm. you give relief. Okay, yeah. if you're training it to lead, and he takes a step forward, don't keep pulling on the lead rope. Mm -hmm. Give it relief. Reward it for stepping forward. That's proper, good pressure and release. But there's, um, uh, no, there's some training methods that definitely need to be changed. And I saw a lot of tail switching going on at that show. Um, and then I saw dumb things that it, spectators in the VIP box did that actually ruined the uh, jumping for one of the contestants. Oh, Just no. as he was coming up to this one jump, somebody stood up in the VIP box right in the horse's line of sight and he refused to jump. Oh. Uh, yeah, but let's not have that kind of stuff going on. He should have been allowed to run that over again. Yeah. I mean, I was watching really carefully. That's exactly what happened. It ruined it for that one contestant. Yeah, people are kind of out to lunch, I think, about how some of their actions impact the horses and... Well, especially when the horse is headed right towards the VIP yeah. box. Yeah. Uh, and it was down low. It was right next to the ring fence. It wasn't one of the sky boxes. It was down, down really low, right at the level of the horse. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah, that's tough. Because I've had a lot of the people going there don't even consider it if they're not full on horse people. But then if they are, then it's like, what are you thinking? Um the next question I had, because I, I was looking at a lot of the architecture designs you've done for meat plants, and I wanted to ask you, have you ever worked on um, any of the shoot systems or the squeezes that they use in the Mustang corrals or for yes. rounding up? Okay, yes. cool. Did and you do used... the hydraulic like press that does their, that they use? Well, that yeah. flying W, that's really nice. I did not design that, but some of my standard cattle handling facilities okay. have cool. been used very successful for like loading Mustangs onto a truck. Yeah. Standard curved cattle handling shoot yeah and worked just fine for, worked really well for mustangs yeah because yeah i was i was looking at the, some of the designs that you like i saw that for the cows you did like pie shaped loading areas and like never any 90 degree corners like smooth corners and i was noticing that it's there's so many similarities to how they build the mustangs pens with that um so i found that so interesting because you know well, they i went to one of the mustang pens and they had a standard curved loading ramp for cattle that uh, that came right out of one of my cattle handling books and and they built it for mustangs and it worked really well perfect yeah so th the next question that i had this is kind of related. like i know in the u.s horse slaughter is not currently legal i'm in canada so we do have horse slaughter plants um i just wanted to ask pertaining to that are there any unique struggles for horses in meat processing plants because well, of how different they are from cows or the main difference with a horse is it's much more flighty. Mm -hmm. And you need, if you, let's say you're using beef facilities, uh, you need to put real high sights on the, on the stun box so they can't see out onto the floor. But the main thing that's different is since they're more flighty, you need to have one person to bring them up the chute and load them into the stun box and another person to shoot them. In cattle, you can have a person load them in the stun box, run around and shoot them. That will work. Don't do that with horses. They need to come into the box, shut the door, bang. Two people. And you also need a really good non-slip floor. Yeah. I can't emphasize that enough. Okay. Yeah. Cause I I was I was reading that there's like, yeah, a lot of differences in horses. Like, cause that, yeah, the height difference I'm sure would be huge with how much lower. Well, you have to any animal, you don't yeah. want to look onto the processing. Yeah. Plant. And and if it, if it's a beef box, you're gonna have to raise the sides on it. Uh, yeah. But I've been in some horse slaughter plants that were pretty rudimentary in their in their design, old and old, and they worked just fine. Okay. And and 
this is the place where you have to make sure you don't have a sunbeam on the floor. You don't have a shadow. You don't have some piece of metal that jiggles. I mm -hmm. make reflection on a puddle on the floor because it's a totally strange place and they're yeah. going to stop and refuse to enter. Yeah. But I went to one that was a rather old fashioned facility in Canada and they just would open the door on the stun box and walk in, bang, it was done. Good. Walk That's good to know. touching them. Yeah. Or you would just, or to get them in, you do the same movement pattern you do in cattle. You want the horse to go this way, then you walk back by them this way mm -hmm. and they go right in. Here's their little movement pattern right here that I have for cattle. And Oh, okay. A little movement pattern. And what you do is you walk back by them. I was just at a plant yesterday. They were doing Holstein steers. And I just walked back by like eight steers and they just went right up the chute. Cool. And so, but most of the horses in this rather old plant, not a fancy facility, uh, most of them, when they opened the gate on the box, they just walked in. That's good to know. Cause I mean, yeah. it, it's hard to know what actually goes on when you see like organizations like PETA that post the videos because I know some of that stuff sensationalized um with how well, abuse we also can have be. have um one of those, those videos that they were in beef equipment and the horses were looking out over the side onto the processing floor and that's absolutely not okay. Yeah. Yeah that's so sad. And you've got to get the distractions out of there because it's a totally novel environment and that's what they're reacting to. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is a going in a different direction with questions, but this is something that I've personally thought about a lot. I like for for reference, I have ADHD, um, so I'm neurodivergent. But I've been wondering, do you think there's any evidence or possibility of any type of neurodivergence in any other mammalian species, or um, would that is that something that's not been looked at, studied, or even considered at all in animal well, sciences? Well, let's take dogs. Uh, now, this is just some dogs are much more affectionate and want attention from people more than other dogs. I've seen that. And some of the animals that are more of the wild type, you tend to get less of that wanting all that contact with people. You know, that's variation in the personality of the animal. And in my book, um, Animals Make Us Human, I talk about the Panskep emotional systems. You have fear, you have anger, you have separation distress, you've got seeking and the urge to explore, you got the sex drive, but then you have this nurture. And this is probably the trait, the oxytocin system, where some dogs have more of that and they want to just be petted constantly and other dogs don't. And while we're talking about petting and with horses, I see people hitting the horses like this. Yeah, That's not petting. Stroke it. Stroke mm -hmm. it. Maybe scratch it on the other. They're hitting their horses. I saw that all the time. No, that's oh, yeah. by the horses hitting. And in Animals in Translation, one of my earlier books, I'm um, when they, I, I had several people come up to me that their relationship with their dog improved because now they were stroking it like the mother's tongue instead of hitting it. Yeah. They didn't realize they were hitting it. But there's definite differences in personalities of animals. And we're now allowed to use the term personality. They'll talk about bold and shy. That'd be the same as high and low fear. Uh, high explorer, explorer, low explorer. Cool. Yeah, I've always what yeah, because I've noticed too, even from Bert, like sometimes they're obviously influenced by being mistreated, but sometimes you'll meet animals who right from birth, they're either yeah, more curious or more interested well, in that's people right. or more that, afraid. That is a legitimate area of research. Yeah. And they're definite and they're genetic differences. Yeah. I so mean, I've seen that with yeah. dogs. I mean, there's some dogs where they just can't get enough petting, and there's other dogs that they're kind of aloof. Yeah. Do you find that the parents of them play a huge role in their personality then, whether they're around them a lot or not? Like um, well, if you, their you parents can, have trauma? Well, learning can also affect things. Yeah. And a lot of rescues, you don't know what they did to them. Some of those dogs have been traumatized. But there's also just innate personality uh, differences. I mean, you talk to moms that have had a whole bunch of children and they'll say, oh, mm -hmm. well, Susie was a lot different than Jim. You know, yeah. or maybe, you know, it's it, in the personality. Yeah. And you definitely can have uh, personality differences in animals. And, you know, 20 years ago, you weren't allowed to use that term. 30 years ago, when I wrote one of my first papers, I wasn't allowed to put the word fear in it. They oh, made wow. me call it agitation. Weird. Well, things have changed a lot. And now we're allowed to use those words. And they are scientifically correct words. Yeah. 
That and must in, be so validating for you that it's and in my that much. animals uh, make us human book, I go through the whole Jack Pence get emotional systems. Cool. I will, I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. Um, animals so, make us yeah. human. It's got um, kind of a tan cover on it. I'll link all your books and whatnot in the description of this as well so people can go and find them. Um, the next question that I had was that I know that it, like, I, like, I don't have as much experience in agriculture as you, but from what I've seen, it seems to be way more common to keep animals like cows and sheep in group housing. Um, and I just wanted to ask your opinion on traditional horse stall architecture and why you think it is that it's so much less common to have horses in group housing, like even indoors. Like I'm thinking of like, dairy cows how when they're even when they're housed indoors they're all in the same well they're in the, the only like right now i just went to a very good a dairy yesterday and uh, you know they used to just raise all the dairy little tiny babies in individual uh huts now they're putting two in the hut Aww. but as soon as six weeks old they're they're group housed mm -hmm. that that's been done in dairies for i've been in the industry for 50 years and when i was in graduate school in the 70s once they were six weeks old they were they were group housed and I think we cause a lot of behavior problems in stallions because they don't get, uh, they don't grow up learning the give and take of social behavior if you keep them locked in a stall. Mm -hmm. And so you get a lot of fighting. Animals that are reared by themselves will sometimes fight. And some of these stallions, young stallions, need to kind of learn some social manners, maybe some older geldings. Mm -hmm. But if you do this, do not do it in a small, confined pen. Yeah. Do this in a big, pasture i saw a really bad situation where the other the geldings just severely bit the horse's back oh, no. because there was no way to get away and it was a small pen and i said you made a big mistake let's never do that again now if that had been in a big pasture but you can have a real problem with a horse that's been reared by itself and and once it's exerted dominance it keeps on fighting it doesn't know it doesn't have to keep fighting Mm -hmm. I saw a black horse one time that had lived alone in a 20 acre pasture. He about tried to kill every horse you put oh, in that God. pasture because he'd been reared totally alone. And that horse had to be removed. He could not live oh, with the wow. other horses. Yeah, that's so sad. It I wonder sad. I wonder why it's so like because because horses and cows are similar enough animals that I found the disconnect between how they're kept kind of odd. Because uh, it, it, I find, especially in city areas, it's actually more common to see horses kept alone than it is. No, I, 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 okay, like at our equine center, we have an equine center in the middle of Denver. Mm -hmm. Really good therapeutic riding program. And what they do every day is turn the, all the horses out in the big arena and let them run around. Now, all it's together. not pasture, yeah. but at least they're running around. They're not, uh, they're in the stalls at night yeah they give them they give them a couple of hours to just run around in the arena together and, wow yeah and together and then the other thing they're doing is every few months they rotate them out and bring in some others and put these guys out on pasture and that's amazing but keeping them um just alone all the time now on the other hand if they had a horse that just was fighting everything else and it wouldn't stop they that horse would have to be taken out of that program mm -hmm. but this, I don't have any problems with keeping horses in stalls at night, but they need to have some turnout where they interact with other animals and mm -hmm. if possible grazing. Yeah. You, know, you have horses in a city situation, there's no way to do grazing, but at least they can run around, interact with other animals, and they tend to really run around. Oh, yeah. Do you find that the way we wean horses as babies causes a lot of behavioral problems depending on how it's done? Because I know some places will do cold turkey weaning where they just take the mom away all at once. Other places will do it more gradual. Um, but well, we're starting now in cattle to do what's called fence line weaning, where um, the calf is more interested in being close to mom than drinking from her. Mm -hmm. And and that's been done with horses, too. Yeah. And then you don't have so much, uh, you know, weaning and uh, uh, separation of bellerin and cattle. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, I would. I want to. I want to reduce the stress. One hundred percent. But I, I think a lot of problems we have in stallions. I think we're we're recreating them. We keep this young yeah. stallion locked up in a stall. You don't have any social manners. Mm -hmm. A Mustang stud asks nicely to breed a mare. Oh yeah. <laughs> You can go into a, a feed yard, like the BLM has these big feed yards. Yeah. And you have 50 studs in a pan. And they just exist. And yeah. they light up like cattle to eat. Yeah. 
and you walk through them, you can touch, you know, they get tame after a while and you can touch them and they get along. Yeah. I found that fascinating because I, I just got two Mustangs and seeing the difference in their social behavior and how well socialized they are compared to like I have some ex race horses who would have been living alone um, for a lot of their life. It's it's fascinating. There's a big difference in how they interact and get used to each other. Um, and it, yeah, it's really cool. It's a much more normal situation. And Sarah Matlock, one of our faculty members, um, they during COVID, a lot of our horse programs got shut down, which was really sad. Um, but they had these Mustangs in a pen and they were training them with clicker training. Cool. And after about six months of cricket training, they had strange men come in and show them at halter. Mm -hmm. I was there. I saw it. Show them at halter. Strange people. Cool. And it worked just fine. Now, one of the things that was uh, found in this was differences. You'd go to the pen where these horses were and you'd have four or five that come right up to you. And then one hothead in the back that took longer to train. Yeah. You know, that's just the difference in their innate level of fearfulness. Yeah. That's so cool. But what they did is just use clicker training that when they approached, they got, a, you know, click and they got fed. Clickers yeah. associated with feed. And and uh, they do any little positive thing, they get a click and it's on a variable reinforcement schedule. Sort of like Vegas. Yeah. You don't get a reward every time you pull the arm on the one am armed bandit. Yeah, it, it gives you an award just part of the time on a variable, very variable. Yeah, well, and then, kind of the same thing with quicker yeah. training. That's awesome. That's so cool. So I had a question, um, and like this is this is about. Um, I had someone that w wanted me to ask you this. They were wondering about finding balance about when to intervene with domesticated animals suffering. Um, like so when you should intervene with euthanasia versus what is a fair level of suffering to keep them in to help them recover from injury or disease how do you kind of know when to when is the time to let go versus well i mean let's say i mean if a horse gets a broken leg it's probably never going to recover if yeah. it's good enough for riding um you have to look at what's the chance of a full recovery that's one of the things i have to look at i uh, but then i've seen stuff where where uh they carried treatment on too long. I remember the, uh, oh, there was a horse years ago that, um, I've forgotten the name of it, where they kept the veterinary stuff going on forever. They had it in a sling, and, and that went on way too long. It's, it's uh, or let's look at, I, I'd have to think more in specific examples. Or let's say it's sick and you're treating it with medication, and it's going to take, a week maybe for it to work. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. But it's, um, you know, one of the big problems now is when do you euthanize old ancient dogs? And you have to think about, does it have a life worth living? The other problem is you get, uh, this happened with my aunt's a German Shepherd. And when I went away to graduate school, the boots, that was the name of the dog, was um, mobile but weak. She was okay. I got back six weeks later and her whole hind end was paralyzed and she was dragging it. And I go, it's time to euthanize her. But you see, my aunt didn't see it because it happened slowly. Yeah. I had been away at graduate school for six weeks. So I she had gone from weak but mobile to dragging her hind end. Yeah. And it's almost like I call it bad becoming normal. Yeah. They don't realize it. And it slowly gets worse. Slowly gets worse and worse. Aww. And and sometimes people try to keep it alive too long and do endless chemos. And you've got to remember, if we do chemo in a person, the person knows why we're doing it. That a dog doesn't know. Yeah. yeah. And you can go on with these things where you're just going on and on and on. I'm not saying you never do chemo in animals. Let's say you do a couple of courses of it and there's a good chance of getting another five years. That's yeah, probably worth doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that that you could do, or you have a dog's diabetic, you're gonna have to give it insulin. If you give it insulin, maybe it's got a decent life. Yeah, you know, that a lot of people would do. That'd be fine. Yeah. I see. I tend to think in specific examples, and I see it, and I talk yeah. about different kinds of thinking. I also talk about animal consciousness in my book, Visual Thinking. An animal lives in a sensory-based world, not a word-based world, mm -hmm. and. 
if what is it seeing, feeling, uh, hearing, tasting, uh, touching? It's sensory based. Yeah, that uh, that actually kind of plays into my next question, because I read um, a quote from you where you were talking about that you identified fear as a primary emotion of an autistic person. So I wanted to ask, like, do you think that you can relate to animals better in that capacity because of how differently you might experience the world from other people? No, I think that helped me maybe with the see horses and cattle are both prey species animals Mm -hmm. and they get scared very easily because they because you know, they see some novel stimuli, some little thing that moves. Well, out in the wild, that might be a lion in the bushes or something that might attack them. Yeah. But, you know, very, very vigilant. Oh, for sure. So do you think that there, like, do you think there's any link between neurodivergency in people and like a connection with animals? Because I know there's been a few studies on horses with their therapeutic work with autistic people. So, it's- well, there's some, I know people that are good horse trainers or also very good at working with cattle that I think are on the autism, autism spectrum. Cool. And, and I, they get along with animals extremely well. In fact, when I'm looking for jobs for people on the spectrum, I talk about the different kinds of minds. you got the visual mind like me, picture mind, picture mind, port math. We're good with animals, mechanical devices, um, photography, and art. Then you have your pattern thinker, things in mathematics, computer science, chemistry, music. And then you have your word thinker, the things completely in words. And I think some word thinkers, I'm not saying all, have a trouble understanding maybe that an animal's conscious. Because they don't think in words. It's mm-hmm. very easy for me to un- think, yeah, well, yeah, the dog definitely thinks. And the dog is definitely conscious. Same thing with the horse. Mm-hmm. And I was just out at a feed yard. I went on a big farm tour yesterday. Went on the feed yard. And this little nine-year-old was riding the horse in this family's feed yard. And um, there were such nice, gentle horses. I was petting their no- noses. They really liked people. It was obvious that nobody had done anything bad to these horses. Mm-hmm. Aww. I was stroking the kid's horse and the, he, he had to had to start riding a new horse and they you know they gave him a trained horse and he just started riding it Aww. and uh, they was um, I stroked the noses of the horses they have no tendency to pull away it was obvious to me that these people had really treated those horses well and then I found out that they had been in my class like <gasps> in the mid 2000s that's so cool um, so that this also plays into what I just asked you. It's um, how do you manage autism and any overwhelm and stress that might have to come with like being around animals who are scared or might be suffering or being like aware of these problems in the world? Is it difficult or? Um... Well, you see this, you see, I don't see that's a very top down generality. Yeah. I tend to think in much more specific. OK, I gave you a specific example where a dog definitely should be euthanized. Another example a vet student gave me, it was disgusting, it was a valuable mayor and they were collecting eggs from her and she was down and crippled and they were keeping her alive to collect eggs from her and she uh-huh. couldn't even walk. And I said, that's totally wrong. Yeah, That was being done strictly for monetary reasons. That's awful. That was an example I got from a vet student. It was quite about 10 years ago. But you see, I think in specific examples of things where that animal's life definitely should have been ended. Mm-hmm. And other things, well, maybe it's sick with something and it gives it some drugs for 10 days, then be better. Yeah, you go ahead and do that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You see, that's thinking about something specific. Mm-hmm. I take specific examples of situations where I think this animal ought to be euthanized and situations where, no, it's going to get better. Yeah, and it'll get better fairly quickly. Yeah, and then does that make it easier to kind of like if there's a yes. solution, you kind of okay, that makes sense. Um, would you? Is there any advice you'd give to people who want to help improve animal welfare um, in terms of how to go about it, how to deal with? Um... Well, let's be specific. When I started out working with cattle, I worked with one thing: cattle handling. Mm-hmm. That's something specific. It's something doable. Yeah. And I worked on training people in cattle handling, and I worked on better facilities. And another thing I did is I wrote about it. I wrote a lot of just how-to articles. Let's say you've got a really good, low-stress, gentle training method for horses. Write about it in the horse magazines. Yeah. And just tell people how to do it. Put it up on your website. Just tell people how to do it. Really simple directions on how to do it. And that's something I've been doing all my life. And as, and as a visual thinker, as I write directions on how to move the cattle, I see them. Yeah. 
See, nothing, so nothing's cool. vague. And and just good how to articles. Yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. You know, to I be took specific. this Mustang and it was wilder and wild, and this is how I channeled it. Yeah. That's that's really I think that's excellent advice just to pick like a specific pick issue something and, specific to work on. Uh, yeah. You can't work on all of animal welfare. That's impossible. Yeah. You could work on training methods. You could work on 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 helping horses that are really, you know, uh, uh, have all kinds of behavior problems. I mean, pick something out that's specific. Now, I don't I don't like horses just housed in stalls all day and they never get to do anything. Yeah. Yeah, and, sure. and in our riding centers, they're taken out and they have time to run around in the arena. Yeah, it's not, and and they like to play. Yeah, they're such funny interactive. I love horses; they're so much fun. But they they um, and a lot of people, um, you know, the, the the rough training stuff has gotten a whole lot less. Yeah, I uh, but there's still some people it, it, they for they just want to force it. Yeah. They're very, some people, I think they take it personally when horses react fearfully and they think it's out of naughtiness or disrespect. Well, you can have a totally trained horse that freaked out in an upright water trough. Yeah. Upright feed trough, rather. It wasn't a water trough. Um, and and the horse that's going to have the biggest reaction to something like that might be an Arab because that animal gets scared more easily than maybe mm -hmm. a quarter horse, a calm quarter horse. So there's different genetic differences in how quickly that animal can get scared 100 percent um so i had another question that someone wanted me to ask you um that they were asking like what is there any advice you would give people who like who either like horse trainers or teachers like people in human education for working with um autistic and neurodivergent people to help make the environment feel safer for them um let's and let's make sure there's no bullying going on in the barn that's I just talked to a student recently uh, that was in college and she was working out at the farm and there were some people in the barn that were really nasty to her. Oh. Let's make sure that kind of stuff is not going on. That's the first thing. The other thing is long strings of verbal instructions don't work. All right, let's say the feeding process for the horses. Make a pilot's checklist with written bullet points mm -hmm. instead of just yak, 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 yak. Because I have a hard time remembering the long strings of verbal information. Mm -hmm. So those are two things you can do that are very simple things in, in yeah. a horse. That's awesome advice. Thank you for that. Okay. So um, another question that I had for you is that I saw in another interview um, where someone asked you if you're vegan and you said that you weren't. So I wanted to ask no, you not. that because... Um, People, I've had people do this to me as well, where they think that if you're involved in animal welfare, that you sh that vegans like the best way to go. Um, so well, I wanted one to thing, ask I don't that. Uh, my my metabolism. I can't function on a vegan diet. Neither yeah. can my mother. Yeah, I get too lightheaded, and I think there are genetic differences in the ability to function on a vegan diet. I would have to, have, um, you know, some animal protein. Yeah. Yeah, I lose weight really quickly too, so I couldn't do fully vegan diet. I would just be skinny. But um, yeah, so I, I found that interesting because like you, you're directly involved in so much of the animal welfare world that, um, like I like I I I guess the point in asking that question is just to kind of clarify for more people that there's more than one way that someone can make a difference. Like you don't need to just be vegan to improve animal welfare. And well, and I'm getting really interested in a lot of sustainability issues. And I've got a paper I've done on grazing, and people don't realize that 20 percent of the world's land can only be grazed, mm -hmm. and you can put goats, cattle, sheep, bison on that land. And if you do the grazing right, you can actually improve the land. Really? I was just yeah. uh, looking at the news and Microsoft Bing had a an article on pe people renting sheep to mow lawns. Oh, cool. You know, that's something that's very, very sustainable. You know, that's really good sustainable stuff um, because you can use the grazing animals to improve land. And then the only way we can raise food on 20% of all the land in the world of habitable land is grazing. There's, yeah. no There's not enough water for crops, not yeah. enough water in the ground and not enough water in the rain. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I, I, it's confusing. There's so much conflicting information that I've seen about that, where people are saying like, Oh, the amount of water we use to water animals is too much. But then yeah, crops require a lot of water too. And, um, and I also found it interesting is that a lot of people who do only eat plant-based diets, I don't think they're necessarily aware of how many animals die, even just 
to maintain crops. Um, well, I think the other thing is, okay, almond milk from a sustainability standpoint is a terrible product because almonds are giant water pigs. Mm-hmm. If you're going to use an alternative milk, it would make a lot more sense to oat, oat milk. Oat milk? Make, that would make a lot more sense. Yeah. Um, but not to grind up almonds. And, and they, they they are gigantic, huge, huge water pigs. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. I'm going to have to get off and yeah. get on another Zoom meeting. They have just texted me. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Thank you yeah, so much um, for doing this. I really it's appreciate really it. really good to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll send you the links to everything when I um, get it all put up. And then I really appreciate you giving me your time because yeah. I know you're super busy. Um, so I really appreciate I'm telling it. the other Zoom call that I'm logging in now. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was lovely talking to you and getting to okay. meet you virtually. All right. Yeah. It was great to talk to you and I'm going to sign off and thank you so much for yeah, having me. Thank you. Have a great day. I will. I hope you all enjoyed that interview as much as I did. And once again, thank you for listening and supporting my podcast. If you're interested in checking out any of Temple Grandin's books, I'm going to link them down below in the podcast description, as well as other means of checking out more information on her and where to find more about her. And I, once again, huge thank you to Temple Grandin for agreeing to talk to me and do this interview in the first place. And thank you to everyone who supports my work and my channel and my podcast, because without the support of you and all of you boosting my posts and whatnot, I don't think I would get the opportunities to talk to influential people such as Temple Grandin. So your support is so hugely appreciated. If you're interested in other means of supporting me, I have a Patreon channel that you can subscribe to for training videos and tutorials and more. You can do so at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash s-d-e-q-u-u-s. I also have an online store where I sell riding apparel and bridles, and I have a bunch of sales going on right now. You can check that out at shop milestone ec. That's shop milestone eq dot com. And I'll also link those below in the podcast description. On a side note, what I'm also trying to do is I'm trying to clear out a bunch of product in my store as well as garner more Patreon subscriptions because my dog recently blew out her knee. So she does require TPLO surgery. And unfortunately, being off the knee that she blew out, she also blew out her other knee. So now both knees are going to be in need of surgery. I already knew that she had knee problems and we were treating her with injections. Um, and unfortunately, the knee that she blew out first was her better knee. And I think the reason why she did it was because she was waiting it more due to her other knee being sore so I figured it was only a matter of time until her bad knee also went but unfortunately it happened way quicker than I anticipated so now we are waiting for our surgery referrals to get a, an appointment booked for her and then she's going to be going in for surgery uh, to get the worst of the two knees done first and then eventually both knees done so it is a huge uh, financial output unfortunately she's not eligible for any insurance coverage because of her pre-existing hip dysplasia and unfortunately the hip dysplasia also aggravates all of the above I feel very sad for her right now because even just standing up is really difficult now that both knees are so damaged so it's going to be a long road to recovery for her but she's a strong little girl and I know she'll get through it but it, it's just really hard seeing how sad she is um so anyways i have made a gofundme for anyone who might be interested in donating to help with her treatment costs unfortunately because she does need two surgeries it's looking like it's going to be anywhere from seven thousand to ten thousand dollars which is obviously a lot of money and unfortunately this is coming less than a month after i just had to replace my truck's transmission unexpectedly because my truck is a 2018 vehicle it should have never happened and that was a huge six thousand dollar cost so that's why i'm trying to clear out a bunch of my products and just gets my ducks in a row to get her surgery done as quickly as possible and I will update once we actually have an appointment but I'll also leave the link below to the GoFundMe in the description of this podcast and again I appreciate anyone and everyone who supports my content because even just watching and sharing my stuff is helpful because I do get some revenue from content such as YouTube unfortunately podcast doesn't really pay because I don't do any ads on it but I still really enjoy doing it and it allows me to talk about important issues like what I discussed with Temple Grandin so anyways thank you for your support and everyone have a great day and stay tuned for the next podcast after this